Hello, multivariable calculus students. This is Mr. Johnson, and this is section 9.4, which is on the cross product. So we just finished studying the dot product, which is our first multiplication of vectors. And now we do the cross product, which is our second multiplication of vectors. And this one is a little bit more lengthy, and it's a little bit more in-depth. Um, unfortunately, this is one of my favorite things to work on you with if we were in person, because what we'll do is, or what, what I typically do with students is that we make a three-dimensional uh, X, Y, Z axes, and we work on things like the right-hand rule to try to figure out where this vector is and things like that. Um, and so I'm going to do the best I can to explain this in a digital setting, and we'll kind of just keep plugging away at trying to grasp the idea of the cross product. So it's going to be a bit of a process here through this section. In a short description, uh, the, the dot product is a number, it's a scalar, and you just got done studying that in 9.3. The cross product, on the other hand, is a vector instead of a number. So it's a vector, which means that when you take the cross product, you're going to get um, from two vectors a third vector. And that third vector is perpendicular to both of the vectors that you crossed. Now, with the dot product, if you remember, we utilized the components that were similar in the vectors. So, for instance, we multiplied the x component of, of a vector a with the x component of vector b. The y component of vector a multiplied by the y component of vector b. Well, with the cross product, we're actually more concerned with the elements, the components that don't match. Um, and so when we look at the cross product, we want to identify a, uh, essentially a third vector. What I'm going to do, though, to start is I'm going to try to explain the cross product geometrically. So I'm not going to explain it um, in the first two pages here in component form. I'm going to explain it in the context of what object the vectors create. So as you can see in our picture in our notes here, we have a vector B and we have a vector A. And if you were to project B over to this side over here and say, okay, well, this is going to be B just project, projected over, and then A is projected over here, you end up forming a parallelogram. And so the first formula, the first thing we're going to look at with cross product is the area of this parallelogram that is formed on a single uh, or on a uh, um, plane using these two vectors to create two sides of this parallelogram. Now, if you were to take the angle between A and B right here, theta, and use a trig identity. So if you were to take the, um, I'll just write this out for you so it makes sense. So if you were to take the sine of that angle, it would equal the opposite side. Let's just pretend like the opposite side is x. We'll just get a, a dummy variable. So it would be the opposite side, which again is right here, this dashed line, and I'm calling that x for right now. Uh, divided by the magnitude of B. So obviously, if we were to solve for that dashed line, we would get the magnitude of B multiplied by the sine of the angle. That's what our textbook uh, shows right here. Now remember, James Stewart's textbook has magnitude as a single bar. I usually write it as a double bar. But either way, this is the image from your textbook. So this particular parallelogram has a base of the magnitude of A, and it has a height, based on what I just explained, of the magnitude of vector B multiplied by the sine of theta. And so if we were to find the area of this parallelogram, so let's do the area of the parallelogram. It would be the base times the height, or in other words, we would get the magnitude of A equal, or, uh, multiplied by the magnitude of B times the sine of the, of the angle between A and B. This happens to be the equation for the magnitude of the cross product between A and B. So again, a, a cross product produces a vector. If we were to take the magnitude of the vector that it produces, that would be the area connected to the parallelogram formed by these two vectors. 
I'm going to show you a little proof of this. It's a really small one. I'm going to show you a proof of this in the next video. Um, but I, I need to show you the component form of cross product first um, before that is going to make any sense. So just kind of trust me, go along with me right now on this. Um, this is the first formula that we have. So uh, again, these two items here are equal. And it says that in the box below, it just sort of defines what I just explained in terms of the magnitude of the cross product being the area of the parallelogram that's formed between the vectors A and B. The formal definition with regard to this angle is down here. And I, I want to make sure that this makes some sense because I think it can be very confusing. I've found that over the years, I've had to clarify this more because um, because people get a little bit caught off guard by this. First of all, if you remember back to the dot product, the formula is actually very similar, but it utilizes cosine of the angle. And if you want to go back to that video and review that, you certainly may. But that's one element of, of multivariable calculus that becomes difficult is that some of the formulas are, are really similar. And so you have to be very aware of um, the, the difference between the angle formula for the dot product and the angle formula for the cross product. Okay, so in this case, when we're looking at our formal definition of the cross product, it is the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times the sine of the angle. Now, this is where all of a sudden in our textbook, it's sort of thrown in. It says it's multiplied by N, and N is a unit vector. Now, <clears throat> If you think, if you look back on what we were just talking about with the area of the parallelogram, we were talking about how the cross product between A and B, if you take the magnitude, is the area of the parallelogram. Well, then all of a sudden, there's this more formal definition that ends up taking out the magnitude. So it's simply just the cross product between A and B. And then they throw in a unit vector. The first thing I want to make a connection of is that if we were to take the magnitude of A and B on the left, and take the magnitude of all of this on the right, the magnitude of n is one because it's a unit vector. So if you were to take the magnitude of both sides, it would perfectly fit what I just explained above with regard to the area of the parallelogram. Okay, so this is, um, not, this is not really a separate thing right now necessarily. However, the n, this vector is really important. So if you remember what I said just a few minutes ago, when you take the, dot, the uh, cross product between two vectors, you end up getting a perpendicular vector in return. So let's say that this is vector A, and let's, and let's say that we're sort of thinking of this in space right now. This is vector B. Okay, the angle between them is theta, which is defined in the formula. The result ve the resultant vector that's perpendicular to both of them is defined here as as n. Now, n is not the vector that we get. n is a unit vector that points in the direction of what we get. So for instance, maybe the vector that's perpendicular to a and b, um, let me draw it a little differently. So let's say that, that the vector that's perpendicular is here, okay? We don't know necessarily what that is at this moment, but if, if we were able to find the perfect direction, we can maybe claim that this little part here is the unit vector n. So n is simply just one unit in length, but it's the direction that we want. And that's what's important here, because if you look at your formula, then the rest of the formula, so if we take you know, uh, this numeric portion of the formula right here, that numeric portion will scale the unit vector n to be the appropriate length for that vector that's that happens to be the cross product between A and B. Um, now remember, the resultant vector there is perpendicular to A, and it's also perpendicular to B, okay? And again, that's the angle between them. So I know that's a little bit strange. I hope I didn't lose you too much on that. Some of you have already seen this, so you're totally fine with it. But I wanted to try to explain what's going on with that particular formula. And I think as we get into the section, um, it will make more sense. But Clearly, you can ask you know, me more questions with regard to that. I'd be happy to try to explain. Here are some properties of the cross product. Um, we will get into a number of these as we continue through the section. One of the big ones that I just want to point out is this first one. 
the cross product order matters and the initial point must be the same. So when you're looking at the vectors A and B, you need to position them in such a way that the initial point is um, starting at the same spot. So for instance, if this is vector A and, um, and this is vector B, okay, those are currently not drawn correctly because the initial point is not, is not um, starting at the same spot. Okay, so you would have to change that and say that vector B would be here, let's say, where that initial point is the same. Okay, now if you change the order, and this is where, you know, if we were in person, we would be going through this visually a little bit more. But if you were to change the order, you do A cross B and then you do B cross A, the resultant vector is going to point in the opposite direction. So if, you, if we go back up to the image that I was showing you over here, the way that I drew it um, is going to be um, A cross B. If you were to take B cross A, you would actually have the resultant vector down in that direction. And um, I hope that once I explain the right hand rule, that's going to make a little bit more sense. But the top one here would be A cross B. And this bottom one would be B cross A. All right. So for that reason, this first property exists in our little list of properties. OK, a couple of other things just to keep in mind. Um, so <clears throat> I mentioned this a few times, but when you take A cross B, the result is um, orthogonal or perpendicular to both A and B. And that's really important to us as we continue to study this. Um, and uh, two non-zero vectors A and B are parallel if and only if the cross product is equal to not the number zero, but the zero vector, okay? For that reason, and this is a little error, so please, this is a typing error, so please fix this. If we were to take our unit vectors, i, j, and k, if we cross them with themselves, so i cross i is the, is the zero vector. So put a little vector in your notes. Um, j cross j is the zero vector. k cross k is the, is the uh, zero vector because again, they're, they're parallel to themselves. Okay, we're going to move on then to page number two and talk about the right hand rule. Okay, I've added a few images here just to see if I can help. The image that you currently have in your notes is this one. This is from our textbook. Um, this is called the right hand rule. The right hand rule in our class, there's a right hand rule for um, a number of different courses, many science courses that have some application to them. Um, we'll have some sort of right-hand rule. In, in our course, the right-hand rule exists simply to know where the resultant vector is going to point. That's about it, okay? Um, the way the right-hand rule works is that you, and I have a little image right above. So what you do is you take your fingers and you, you point your fingers in the direction of the first vector. So your fingers are outstretched. They're pointing towards U in this example because U cross V, U is the first one. So your fingers point towards U and you, you, you line your hand up in such a way that your fingers then, when you curl them, you make a fist, your fingers will curl towards V, which is gonna be the second vector. So U cross V is how it's gonna um, set your hand up. And if your thumb is pointing um, in, in, in this way, your thumb will be pointing in the direction of the resultant vector. Now, those of you that can, can sort of spatially you know, reason this out are going to be completely fine with this. Those of you that can't, it's, it's going to be terribly difficult. Um, if you were to go and take V cross U, and just for a moment, try to visualize. I mean, try to you know sit there while you're watching this and try this on your own. If you were to line your hand up so that your fingers were in the direction of V, and you may even need to turn your paper or turn your hand a little bit, try to get this set up, and you curled your fingers towards you, you'll find that your thumb will actually point in the exact opposite direction. Okay, and so that's it's it's important to be able to grasp this, but it's also really difficult. So it takes a little bit of time. Okay, um, again, 
the entire goal of the right-hand rule is to be able to determine where the resultant vector is. I have another image um, that you know might be helpful. If it's not, you know, forget it. I'm just trying to give you lots of options. Some people will have you instead of using <clears throat> all your fingers, you're using um, your pointer and middle finger, and you 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 know instead of curling all your fingers over, you simply just take um, you point your finger and curl it to your middle finger. It's the same exact idea, um, but it's still the right hand rule and all that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, again, you know, you, you curl whatever vector you're starting with in the cross product. You have A cross B. You would take A, you'd curl your fingers to B. Okay. Um, all right. The way we're going to begin this is that we're going to start with our unit vectors and the first one we have there is I cross J, and I was, I feel like I was lucky enough to find an image of this. I tried to find images of all six of them, and I kind of failed. I found I found one. Thankfully, it's the first one. And so, um, if you're taking I cross J, remember, let me just back up here for a second. So, if we have our traditional grid, let's say that this is X, and this is going to be Y and then Z. So you have your unit vector I and your unit vector J. I'll put in a different color here. And then you have your unit vector K. All right, so if we're trying to figure out <clears throat> what in the world the cross product of all of these would be, here's a nice little image of I cross J. So if you notice, the fingers, if they were extended, would be pointing in the direction of positive I. And those, and then your hand, your fingers would curl towards J. They would curl with the angle, and your thumb is pointing at positive K. So I cross J is going to be positive K. Now, if you were able to sort of turn your, your, your mind around here with that image if you were to do the opposite j cross i so if you were to line your fingers up with positive j and you were to curl it towards i and you were able to successfully kind of manipulate your hand in that position your thumb would be pointing in the direction of negative k and so therefore j cross i is negative k I know, because I, I, I know a number of you well enough, that some of you are going to be totally fine, and others of you, this is going to be terribly challenging, okay? So just bear with me and, and try this, all right? I think maybe what I'd like you, know, like you to try here is to pause the video for a minute. I'm going to fill out the other four, so if you pause the video now, you can try them on your own. It's nothing hurt by guessing. Give it a shot. Try those four. And, in, in, and then come back to the video, and I'm just going to give you guys the answers, okay? All right, well, I hope you were able to try, and um, I hope that you got these four correct. You probably figured out the pattern that, you know, at least the answer was the one that wasn't included. So I, I cross K, it had to be something with J, negative or positive, you know. But again, what you're trying to do is you're, is you're trying to mimic this right-hand rule in order to get those four. Um you know, due to the nature of the course, <clears throat> you know, maybe during class we can then chat just individually or in small groups and try to do this and 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 show the the motion of this to try to get these resultant vectors. Okay, I'm going to give you a couple examples related to this. So example one, we have two vectors v and u. We're going to we're going to try to calculate here the magnitude of u cross v. And the magnitude is going to be the mag or the um, magnitude of the cross product is going to be the magnitude of u times the magnitude of v times the sine of the angle between them, which in this case is going to be 45 degrees. And so what we get is four times five, so we get 20 times sine of 45. That's going to be root two over two. So we get 10 root two for our magnitude. Remember everyone, that if you were to sort of project um, these two vectors and form a parallelogram here, okay, we just found the area of the parallelogram, all right? So that's um, one of the applications to this. 
then it asks us to figure out um, is the resultant vector, so is the actual cross product, the vector that's formed by the cross product going to be pointing into the page or out of the page? So again, your goal here is to try to line your hand up so your fingers are straight in the direction of the first vector, so in the direction of you. So take your right hand, position your fingers um, right along you, and curl them towards V. And if you can successfully do that, you'll find that your that your thumb will point right out of the page, which means that um, that that's kind of coming back at you. Okay, so our answer here is that it's going to be out out of the page. Okay, with example two, our vectors are not lined up correctly. Remember, I mentioned that the initial point needs to be the same. So what we need here is for u to be just like this, and we're going to calculate u cross v, which means we're going to go in this direction for our angle. Um, now the angle of that we have to first calculate because again that the 120 is misleading because it's not 120 degrees um, between them because they weren't positioned correctly. So this is going to be 60 degrees here. All right, so we have the magnitude of u cross v equal to 12 times 16, and then we're going to take the sine of 60 degrees, and 12 times 16 is going to be 192, and the sine of 60 is root 3 over 2, and so what we get is 96 root 3. And again, that's going to be the parallelogram formed by those two vectors as well. This time, <clears throat> try to try to position your hands so your fingers are extended, pointing towards U, and then you'll curl them towards V. If you can do that successfully, you'll find that your thumb is pointing into the page this time instead of out of the page. All right, one last one here. So we have vector A, which is in the XY plane, and vector B, which is in the direction of K. Um, uh, and, and so what that means is it's along the z-axis. The lengths are 3 and 2, and we want to find first the magnitude of the cross product. So we have the uh, magnitude of A, which is 3, magnitude of B, which is 2. Then we have the sine of the angle between them. So the angle between them here, since A is in the xy plane and B is on the z-axis, is going to be 90 degrees. And sine of 90 is 1, so we just get 6 there. That's pretty straightforward. Okay, so then B. So B says that <clears throat> based on the cross product, what are the components of the cross product of A and B? Now, if we think about A, so A is made up of a, a positive x component, a positive y component, and z would be 0 because, again, a is an xy plane, so it doesn't go up at all. So z is 0, but it's along the positive x, along the positive y. Okay, With b, we have 0 for x because it doesn't go in the x direction at all. We have 0 for y, same reasoning, and then we have some sort of positive k value. So that's kind of what we're what we're starting with. Now that doesn't help us a ton, but that's the idea behind A and B. If you were to do the right hand rule, and keep in mind that your angle is going from A to B, and your fingers are along A, and they curl to B, where would your thumb be pointing? And if you can successfully do the right hand rule, you're going to get a vector that's going to be sort of like that. And remember, it's perpendicular to A, it's also perpendicular to B. Now, <clears throat> if our angle between A and B is 90 degrees already, and then the resultant angle or the resultant vector has an angle of 90 to both A and B as well, then the resultant vector must be in the xy plane. It has to be. We have to be able to deductively figure that out. 
Now, what does it mean in terms of our components? Well, if we're looking at A cross B, we know based on our assumption here and our right-hand rule, we know that X must be positive because you're along the positive x-axis here. Y, on the other hand, must be negative because you're kind of off in that other quadrant there. So that's going to be negative. And because A and B have a 90 degree between them, and because the resultant vector is a 90 degree between all of them, then we're in the xy plane, and z must have a zero component. OK, so that's example three. In the next video, we will start to tackle some of the other parts and talk about the component form of the cross product.